Hey guys, today's episode with James Laurinaitis, the former NFL linebacker, is a powerful one, and it's coming up in just a minute on Sports Spectrum, and today we are presented by the Sports Spectrum Podcast Network. Make sure you check out sportsspectrum.com for more stories, more conversations on the intersection of sports and faith in Jesus Christ. It's all available at sportsspectrum.com. This is the Sports Spectrum Podcast, where faith and sports intersect. Now let's bring in our host, former ESPN producer, Jason Romano. And welcome everyone to the show. I am Jason Romano. So glad to have you joining us here on the show today. I am your host, and this is the Sports Spectrum Podcast. We are the intersection of sports and faith. And you can check out our website, sportsspectrum.com, for all of our content. And while you're there, sign up for Sports Spectrum weekly you click that newsletter icon at the top you put in your email address and you can stay in touch with all that we have going on here at sports spectrum podcasts articles devotionals all available for free and they can come right to your email inbox each wednesday morning when you sign up for sports spectrum weekly for free at sportspectrum.com and if you have a guest idea or a topic or something that you think we should be covering here at sports spectrum maybe you know someone that you think would make a good guest here on this or one of our other podcasts, well, you can email me directly, jason at sportspectrum.com. That's my email address. comes directly to me. Would love to hear from you. My email again, jason at sportspectrum.com. We got a great conversation today with James Laurinaitis. He is the former NFL linebacker, the two-time Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year when he was with college starring for the Buckeyes at Ohio State. He came into the NFL as a second-round pick in 2009 by the Rams and played seven seasons with the Rams, played one more season in 2016 with the New Orleans Saints, and then retired at the age of 30 from the NFL. And now he's in the broadcasting world as the co-host of Bishop and Laurinaitis, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern on the fan 97.1 FM in Columbus, Ohio. So James is talking to his Buckeye faithful every single day on the radio. He's, of course, the son of Joe Laurinaitis, who was Road Warrior Animal, one half of the Road Warriors wrestling duo in the WWE. And James lost his dad last year in September of 2020. His dad died of a heart attack just a couple days after his 60th birthday. And so we talk about that death and how it affected James, his faith, being able to look at a death as a positive in the sense of being able to tell others about Jesus. And we also talk about some other topics too, including social media, broadcasting in a pandemic, creating authentic relationships, and his favorite thing, being a dad. James Laurinaitis, the former NFL linebacker, former Ohio State Buckeye, Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year, joins us today on Sports Spectrum. Hey, James, welcome back to the show. Uh, Good to be with you, man. And I'm proud of, uh, obviously, the long list of guests you've got to interview and the book. And it's it's awesome to see where this platform has gone for you. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate you uh, and your support and certainly our our relationship and our friendship, which was birthed at the NFL Broadcast Boot Camp uh, in 2017, I believe, in the the spring. And then I fast forward now because we had you on right after that. Uh, and now you're a radio host, kind of doing a show That's every right. day for three hours in Columbus. How's that been going for you? Yeah, it's been great. The broadcast boot camp, I tell you what, if you are a NFL guy, um, think, even just debating, like, should I do anything in media? It's interested you a little bit. Um, that that whole platform was incredible to be able to go there. I never even went there thinking anything about radio. That's the funny thing is I went there strictly thinking about calling games, which I do do as well for the Big Ten Network in the fall. Yes. But it's I thought that was like it. And then I got this opportunity to start with a two hour show in Columbus. And I thought, my goodness, what am I going to talk about? Because the show started in May. So I'm like, it's not even starting a football season. That's <laughs> that's easy. Being in Columbus, Ohio, talking Buckeye football. You can just especially two hours. You can get through a show easily. Yes. Um, but now it, it got pushed to three and, and, um, uh, it's been, it's been a blessing. It's been, uh, challenging and rewarding all in the same sense. A lot of stories that have kind of come out of nowhere. Um, 
And when you're doing it live on the radio, you have to be very calculated with what you say, yet you're also supposed to be opinionated. So it's fun. I've enjoyed it. You uh, are a proud Ohio State alum, uh, but you are a Big Ten Network college football analyst, and you're a radio show host, co-host in Columbus. So how do you manage the whole Ohio State Buckeye fandom, which clearly you're rooting for them to win every game as an alum, but also putting on the analyst hat as a Big Ten network? So you might not even be calling an Ohio State game, but on the radio, you're also speaking and, and talking to fans the majority, if not all of them who root for the Buckeyes, how are you kind of balancing all of that? Well, I think, I think Jason, the, the time with the big 10 network has really helped because it's, it's flipping this hat of you're breaking down the whole conference. Um, the hardest thing at first was not saying we, when speaking about Ohio state, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's Ohio state. Yes. Um, but then also putting that hat on when you're on the radio, knowing that you are speaking to your fan base. So it is we, and we got to do this. And so um, I, I just try to be very aware. Um, I've never, so I think thankfully for me, I'm not from Ohio. So there's no like pull of extreme Homerism. <laughs> now I'm sure maybe some people on the big 10 might, might think differently, but yeah. I, I just, I tend to be as objective as possible. And, and I love calling other other teams you know I love calling uh you know it doesn't matter the size of the game like last year we had Michigan Rutgers and triple overtime which was fun so um it's just it's the challenge of prepping it's the challenge of getting this roster down and being able to you know understand not only the names but the stories and the careers of these players and and celebrating the game of college football but it is difficult to weigh the narratives of like hey I'm talking to people in Columbus versus I'm talking to the big 10 as a whole. Those are very, two very different. Uh, you can be truthful on both, but it doesn't go well. You know, you don't, no one wants to hear you get on big 10 network and say, Oh, it's Ohio state and everybody else, you know, now in Columbus, that's what they want you to say <laughs> over yeah. and over. So it is a challenge. Well, one thing that they would have never taught us at the broadcast boot camp was how to broadcast in the middle of a pandemic. And that happened for you and you and I were talking and still, the effects of that pandemic are obviously happening in our world, but they are still affecting a lot of people and how they go and broadcast a show. What was la last year like when you had to pivot? Uh, I'm guessing for these Big Ten Network games, which is pretty much like every other network, you were doing them from home. Uh, what was that like kind of last year as a broadcaster, knowing you couldn't really go to a lot of games? It was difficult. So the radio show we did from home, um, uh for 60 plus weeks, but thankfully my, my co-host already lives in Hudson, Ohio. So it's near Cleveland and he does some stuff with the Browns or was doing stuff with the Browns. He still is, but it's just his stuff changed because the NFL really locked down last year with stuff, but yeah. he used to broadcast the show from the Browns facility. I'd do it from studio, the miracle of modern day radio where you can do it from anywhere. Um, and I'd had a few reps with Sirius XM, which operates that way. A lot of the time, you know, guys live different places. They do shows together. Uh, but that, that was okay. The big time network, we thankfully still went to the site almost every week, except the last week. And it wasn't COVID related. It was snowstorm in the East coast. So <laughs> that, that week we went to Chicago and had to do the games on monitors, which it's difficult. It's tough to keep the energy up. Um, it's difficult even without fans because even in your headset, you'd hear the artificial fan noise, but to look out there and not see anybody and there's not the traditions, there's not the band, there's no cheerleading. You have to remind yourself like, okay, keep your energy up talking about the game. Um, but really it's just, it was, it was, you had to be flexible. Right. And I think a lot of us, heck, I'm not going to complain because I know there's so many other people that had to go through a lot more, uh, I mean, I think about moms trying to work from home and be teacher and the whole deal of, of the stress and the anxiety that the whole world went through. Yeah. I mean, we'll be, I think we'll be studying this for a long time, but little adjustments here and there, the testing every week, the go to games, you know, you just, we were doing the rapid testing too. So, you know, if you get a false positive, it doesn't matter, you know, for, for safety purposes, go home. And so, there's always that anxiety. You land somewhere, you get there, pull the mask down, test, put it back up. All right. And you kind of wait around. If no news is good news, and then you go and you prepare. But I had a few, a few um, coworkers that weren't so lucky with that, where they had false positives. You know, they had to 
drive. Then they have to drive back. You know, one instance guy drive back from Columbus to Chicago, got yeah. home, tested again, and got two negative tests back to back, and was like, "I told you it was a false pot." But we're all just trying. We're all just trying to get through it, and um, just had to be flexible, man. Yeah, there's no blueprint on on all of this. This was so weird of a year, and it still is. We're still living in the sort of weirdness. It's it's. There's better. Things, things are getting better. You know, we're expecting fans in the horseshoe this year. So things are getting better, but it's still, it's still weird, right? It's still weird. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. And, and I think the thing is, is that we're all just trying to um, look I think you can look around and I think a lot of the country is just ready. Like we're all ready. Like we're all ready just to get back to what any semblance of what life was before. I think it's hard for a lot of people to realize that it might not be fully what life was before. And that's okay. I think we just need to extend grace to people who, um, you know, that see things differently than us. And I think that's, what's hard is I struggle with wondering whether society has really taken a dip or whether it's just those who are the loudest on the fringes, you know, that get a lot of the attention. Um, but you know, if, if somebody doesn't agree with you, let's extend some grace and understand that some people might want to wear a mask forever. Some might not. And uh, I'm going to try to choose to love you. I have family members that are on both sides of the spectrum. And I just, I try to choose to love them no matter what your views are. Let's not let any of this ruin our relationships. What's your take on social media in the sense of, you know, having opinions, having sharing things and saying, I disagree or I agree, but at the same time showing empathy, which is a very hard thing to do. Uh, on social media for a lot of people. What's your take on, on social? Because we both use it. We're both active on there, um, yeah. sharing sports, sharing other things, stories, whatever. But I'm just curious what your thoughts are, as, especially as a former you know, pro athlete who has a, a pretty large audience of people paying attention to what you have to say. I view social media um, now as basically a platform to try to support any views that I agree with or things that just will cheer me up throughout the day. I, I te- I've slowed down a little bit on Twitter. You can, it's kind of like watching the news, you know, you, you can, you can just get in a dark place. You can start listening to people who think only like you. I think it's very wise to, after you read something on social to just pause for a while. And, and before you just throw something out, I even stopped tweeting during like live sports because it just, for one, like, I felt like if you're tweeting, you know, Oh, what a catch. Like, so is everybody else. It's nothing new. You know, I understand it's being about part of the conversation, but I've really started to crave Jason authentic relationships that are deeper than social. It could be so fleeting and misleading about who's there. And, um, and look, I understand it's tough because I understand it's part of our, it's part of the fabric of my generation, especially that was raised on this. Like I've had friends that I found out they were having a kid from a tweet and being like, you couldn't give me a ring. And to them, it wasn't even, it was the same, more than the same. Like whether I called you or put it on, so it was just easier to post it. I'm like, okay, I understand that. But I'm maybe call me old fashioned. But like, if like, if I have a, like if my wife and I were to have ever have a fourth child, I would call those of my family first. And then those that I would consider my inner circle before posting it. And, um, I guess having said that now, there might be some people watching it be like, hold on, I never got, (laughs) but you know, it's just, and my wife's that way too, where I just, and I think I really found out a lot when my father died, I found out, you know, you have, look, and I'm not, I try not to judge people based on their response to it, but there is something about, you got a lot of phone calls, a lot of text messages, but there were a few that. It wasn't just a day. It was the next day. It was a week after, a month after a call saying, how are you still doing? You know, not just, uh, and I think those, it just gave me a new perspective on like, you know what, when someone goes through something, step outside of your life, put yourself in their shoes and stick by that friend for weeks. Because I, I guess I, it took me, my dad passing to really notice those around me that were still walking with me weeks after. How do you crave that um, authentic relationship? Is it just simply that? Is it going above and beyond uh, tweeting or posting? Uh, is it, is it um, you know, carving out legit time to talk about yeah. things that are real as opposed to, you know, just talking about football or whatever, you know, the latest topic was on the show that you have that day? Yeah. 
How do you create yeah. that? How do you, how do you create that? I try to stay away from a recognized transactional relationships where it's, you know, what I hang out with this person because it's a status thing and vice versa. And we're all around the same people. And it's like, yeah, that's what I try to avoid. And I, and I know that there's, look, there's a part of our business in and of itself. That's networking. Networking is a whole bunch of that. Right. And so I understand that's part of the fact I try to just take it, take it deeper than that and not just, uh, and, and really just take time to, to ask important questions. It doesn't, you don't have to see eye to eye with me. I mean, that's the beauty about sports. I think is there's a whole lot of guys that I've played with that I don't see eye to eye with, but I know that they'd have my back and vice versa. And it's just showing up time and again. And it's tough. I mean, it's really tough because, you know, you'll come across people, um, as an athlete to where sometimes people put you on too high of a pedestal to where they're like, Oh, you know, Laurenitis might be okay. They probably have a plethora of friends that they have. And they're almost like, and we're like, well, I mean, no, we're, we're open to hanging out with anybody. Or then there's some who go the total other way, um, who just, it, it's purely transactional. And so it, it's, you just seek out those who want absolutely nothing from you. And I think that's the, the authenticity is just, you know, what? like there's no expectations and you can just be you and that's fine. And it's tough to seek out. And, um, I'd be lying if over the last four or five years, you didn't realize that you got burned by, um, whether it was some people that you thought were a certain way that aren't. And, um, but heck, I, I try to remember that. I'm, I hope I haven't done that to somebody else either. You know what I mean? So it's, it's a constant holding up the mirror to yourself and trying to, to, uh, look at your own behavior first. It's really hard, especially when you're a public figure, right? Or you have something that's related to, I mean, I, I was never at any level a public figure, but, you know, working at a place like ESPN and, and, and having some friends that didn't work there, a lot of friends that didn't work there. And I was mm-hmm. craving friends who weren't connected to work just because I needed right. to talk about something other than work all the mm-hmm. time. But yet the transactional part is real because you always felt like whenever somebody was reaching out, they wanted something like, can you cook me up with a tour or do you, can you get me tickets to a game or can you introduce me to this celebrity that you spent time with? And I was like, man, that's not, that's not a relationship, man. That's not the way I'm, I'm trying to roll here. Right. I want to hang out with people who, like you said, just want to hang out with nothing in return, not to take, I just want to spend time. Um, that had to be, has to be, had to be, and has to be really tough for you. It is. And, and what's ironic about that, I'm sure you feel the same way. Like when you have a true, like deep friendship with somebody, like you want to share all those things with them. Like, you know, like Correct. whatever I, you know, so like people that I have friends that aren't in the football world, it's the fact that they don't expect it. That makes me want to take them to the Woody Hayes athletic center and show them the tour and show them the all American wall and the football field and the locker room. Absolutely. But it's like once it becomes an expectation, that's the first turnoff of like, ah, I don't know, you know, I'm not, and it's it's weird. I mean, I've had that with my own family members. It's because I think that the, when you have something to share like that, that's so cool and unique, you love like when you have that experience, you want to share it. That you want to see the fate. Like it's like watching a great movie, right? And then you have a friend, and you're like, man, you have to see this movie. Like you want to watch it with them. Mm-hmm. But like once that becomes an expectation and an entitlement, you start to really question the motives and, I, and that's hard. You just got to, and look, you're not, you're never going to find true friendship unless you're vulnerable too. And so once you get that point of being vulnerable, you have to understand that, uh, I mean, heartbreak will, is possible. You know, there's a, I'm not smart enough to remember the direct quote, but CS Lewis talks about that where, you know, basically if you're not willing to love, um, then you're not, you're never going to experience like loving is hard. There's heartbreak with love. And that's just the reality. And if you want to avoid heartbreak, then don't ever try to fall in love. Cause it's, you know, that's friendships, that's relationships. It's all that. So, um, it just takes, it takes time. And, and I think right now we live in a culture that is so obviously with social media, everything right there, which can be used for good. I don't want to bash on all of it, but it's, um, you can't replace the time that builds up those, those deep roots. Let's take a quick break to tell you again about our sports spectrum magazine available now for just $18 for a one year subscription, just $30 
for a two-year subscription. I think it's the best thing that we do here at Sports Spectrum, and you can subscribe right now at sportspectrum.com. It's super easy. You click on the magazine icon at the website, and you're good to go. You can actually get a digital version of the magazine to complement the print version that you will get in the mail when you subscribe to the Sports Spectrum magazine. It is a great resource. I tell people the magazine, it's not your typical magazine that you just pick up and kind of peruse through. This is one that I think is a resource for you as you continue in your ministry. And whether you're a coach or a teacher or a pastor or a leader, wherever you are, whatever influence you have, knowing that you want to share the gospel, maybe use sports as a gateway to share the gospel, the Sports Spectrum magazine is a great resource for you. It might be a great resource for someone else. You can get it for yourself, get it as a gift for someone else. Maybe get a bunch and go through it together in a team setting, in a small group setting. But you can subscribe right now at sportspectrum.com. Again, $18 for a one-year subscription, $30 for a two-year subscription. Super cheap and available right now to order at sportspectrum.com. He is James Laronitis, and we're so happy to have James here on Sports Spectrum today. Um, you mentioned 2020, a uh, tough year for all of us, and uh, it was September 22nd, and you mentioned it. Your dad had passed. Um, mm-hmm. Just curious, your dad, by the way, for those that don't know, road warrior animal himself, Joe Laurinaitis. Um, what was that like going through that? Describe what it was like, because the grief process is so different for everybody, and it was sudden, too. It was, it was a shock. Yeah. Um, what was that like for you? I just think as a human, but also from being a person who loves Jesus and, and is a man of faith. Yeah. So it, it um, you know, I had lost my grandpa a couple of years before that, my dad's dad. And um, with him, you could see the decline. You could, um, when he went into hospice care, we were able to fly down and see him and give him a hug and say goodbye kind of. And, and that's a whole different it's hard, but it's different, you know? And, and I knew my dad had had a heart failure. Um, I knew that he was dealing with type two diabetes. His kidneys were starting to go in. Um, but there, there was no, you know, when you have a heart attack, there's no, you know, knock, knock, knock. Oh, Hey, here, you know, it was had a heart attack was, was gone before the paramedics showed up and nothing they could do. And so I, I just, the, whenever you get a call in the middle of the night from a family member, you know, it isn't good. And it was such a, it was such a shock trying to talk to my sister, um, to keep her under control, to keep her from losing her mind. It was, you know, you have this moment of trying to figure out what's going on to then the the deep settling, to then the planning for the funeral, to the funeral and you see everybody to then it really hits you after the funeral where you're finally by yourself. And I said it at my at the funeral, and and partially because I, I was living it in the moment, but I also have some family members who are not believers, and I just said it through tears. I I don't know how you could navigate this world or life or death without believing in resurrection and mm-hmm. believing in Christ. I just it really there's a deep part of me, and we could go on for hours if you wanted about how so many people's lives were instantly changed to the point of willing to die for it at the idea that the tomb was empty. They had seen the risen Jesus. Like if you want to make up a story, there's numerous books that are, that can explain this better than I can. Right. But back in that culture, you're not making up that women were at the tomb first. You're not making up. There's so many, like the, the closest, the founders of the church are all very flawed people. You're not, that's not stuff that you're putting in a, a fictitious. Thing. So anyway, like there's all these things that tie into the deep life change and why the resurrection is real. That's a bigger picture. Like if you don't have that hope and someone passes away, my goodness, like what's the point? Right. Like how, you know, like what's the point of even living? Like that's the whole thing. Like if you're, if, if there's no point to all this. I always, you know, that's one of the things I think right now that's, you see people that are fighting for justice, which is a massive, great thing across the board, but that whole stem, like it it stems from Christianity. Like you're fighting for justice because you believe that people who are wrong are created in the image of God. And so 
if you don't believe in God, you're taking God away from that. Then no, then we're just like nature and nature is not just like <laughs> nature right. is vicious. I'm at a barn right now and out here I'm seeing these birds fight. There's a hawk swooping around. This hawk's going to come tear up some mouse, field mouse here in a little bit. Like, you know, like that's nature. And so I just, there's this, I had this overwhelming sense of like, thank the Lord that my dad was a believer because I know I'll get to embrace him again. My dad had these massive bear hugs, even when he shrunk in size a little, like he just big dude. So just these massive bear hugs. He always had the goatee. I, I can still feel like the way the goatee would like tickle my neck when he'd hug you tight. Hmm. Like my hope is I'm going to embrace him like that again. And I can't wait for that day. It'll be great. Um, I'd be lying if I, there's still are times where, I mean, I'll look at my phone or I'll take a photo of the girls, you know, he never got to meet my youngest uh, Remy. And so there's times where I'll take a photo or a video of her starting to crawl and, it's just second nature to type in dad first. And it's like, you're going to send it to him. And it's like this wave of grief comes over you, but I'm just consistently hold firm to what is in the scripture about how everything has been prepared for us and heaven and earth will meet again and all things will be made new. And that's the hope. And if you don't have, gosh, I, I don't even know how you would navigate this world, Jason, without that hope, because it's, it can just be a cruel place, you know, it really is. It can be a cruel yeah. place and it can be full of sadness if you don't have that. Did you see this tragedy? We'll call it that obviously losing your father as a way to share the gospel with others, not just at the funeral, but to be able to point people to Christ because your dad, like you said, loves, love Jesus. And he's, mm -hmm. you know, in heaven right now with him. And you get an opportunity to really tell people, at a moment where a lot of people would be willing to listen because yeah. of the tragedy, because of the figure your dad was and the fans that he had as a WWE superstar, as a wrestling superstar, and certainly as the platform and the influence that you have. Did you see that as an opportunity to, to witness, if you will, to other people? Yeah, I've always felt that um, even when I was in college, Jason, I had an, I had an idea of, man, what an amazing platform I've been given to be able to share my faith, live it out in a certain way. Um, you know, for the longest time, I felt that I had to like be perfect before that. And it's, it's been a, it might, some of that might be this athlete in me where it's like, it's constantly striving towards a goal, but like with Christ, there's no striving. It is, it's accomplished. It's finished. It's paid for. And out of that, that action, that love, that, that sacrifice, then, then you change your behavior. You don't have to get your behavior in line. So even, you know, so I realized that in college and then I started realizing, wow, you had a platform. My dad showed me his platform for using it for Christ. And I absolutely think the funeral helped because there's a lot of times in those moments where I'm sharing scripture on social or just, I would voice those things and even have conversations with people. I found Instagram in general, um, you know, it's a little easier to kind of repost things on there than Twitter sometimes, but I found Instagram. I, I just, I got to a point where like, I just understand that not everyone that follows me is probably a believer. Right. But like if you want to authentically know me, then I'm going to throw up stuff on there, whether it's a quote, whether it's a worship song, whether it's a, I mean, I, I have a great obsession with everything that the Bible project does. Um, yes. We talked about that. I mean, yeah. You know, there's a lot there of content. That's like, I can only explain things so much. I went to a state college. All right. So I'm not the, I'm willing to admit I'm not the brightest, <laughs> no matter how much Googling and stuff and uh, words, but like to, to share things that have helped me along the way, I try to repost because I know if it helped me, it's going to help somebody else and probably a lot of other people. And that, to be honest, it's probably been the most rewarding thing is that I will get messages on Instagram saying, thanks for posting this. You have no idea how much I needed that. And I think that is one of the cool things about social is that here I am just thinking, you know what, this is a great little thing that the Bible project did. Let me throw this up there. And then all of a sudden, boom, you're like, there's a message from Instagram that says, man, you have no idea how down I was. I really needed that word today. Thanks. And you're like, no idea. Mm. Only the spirit knew, you know, and that prompted me to put it, it's it's fascinating to see the how those things work. And um yeah, the funeral definitely helped me. It just helped me 
I guess just, I just tried to be real. I mean, I, there's, there's, there was no really way to kind of go through that moment of life without just being authentic. You know, it's, it's crazy. And as di what's different too, you know, is it's a blessing and a curse when your father is famous because right. the blessing is, is that you don't have to keep bumping into people over and over and over and telling them your dad passed because everyone knows out the gate. I mean, I had a call from TMZ at six 30 in the morning asking to confirm. And I just hung up. I was not, that's not what that's, that's so early. It was so raw and fresh still. I'm like, I'm not confirm. Like I, this is my dad. This is not like, you know, so, yeah. um, but it's also, you know, the, the thing is, is that there was so much outpouring of, of love that was like overwhelming to try to respond to everybody in that moment. So it yeah. was, um, yeah, it's, it's crazy to, to come up and, you know, it's almost been a year already and life just rolls on, but I'm thankful for the little moments. You know, I got a lot of great memories of pops and, and I have, I kept, I kept two voicemails from him on my phone. Thank goodness for, you know, technology with these voicemails now, but I was able to keep uh, two voicemails from father's day, 2020 and, uh, That's and great. got to re-listen to those this year. So it wasn't easy, but to be able to hear his voice still is, it's a nice little, nice little bit of technology to have. Well, if you're okay with this, I'd like to ask you about one other memory with your dad. Um, because you know, you do research online when you're preparing for interviews. And I, I just searched your dad's name and, and, and Jesus. And I came across this very old, what appeared to be old website. Um, I really, I couldn't even copy and paste the, the text. I had to write it myself. That's how old this website was, but it was actually your dad sharing his testimony. And uh, he talked about answering an altar call. Um, and I want to read just a little bit of what he wrote because you were there with him as, I, I, as I'm reading this. I'm presuming this is true. <laughs> it says, uh, after seeing all the, all the feats of strength and hearing the testimonies, they did an altar call. He found himself at a conference. I believe it was at. You can, you can kind of share a little more context on this. He goes, I felt pulled by an unfamiliar force, a feeling that was unfamiliar to me. And it was the Holy Spirit. My son, James, grabs my hand and says, come on, daddy, let's go. And I look at my wife and without hesitation, we all went up, became born again, recited the sinner's prayer and became Christians. And from that day forward, I've been that way ever since. That was the most single best thing I have ever done in my life. And when I was reading that, James, and I went through and went back and, and saw that, I was like, wow, I, we didn't talk about that. I think the first time we had you on the show. Um, do you remember that day? Cause he's saying my son, James grabs my hand. I have to imagine you were probably what, like 10 years old, something like that. I was like 13 or 14. Um, it was right before high school. And it's funny. It's like when we went to church, it was always, gosh, my head. <laughs> I hope, I hope that my grandpa who's a believer is giving him heck for this. I hope Jesus gave him a hard time for this. So we used to always show up. <laughs> Like only on holidays, it was like Easter and Christmas before this moment that we're talking about. And we went to this big church, you know, it has two stories and all that. And my dad always wanted to get there after the choir was done. And before the choir, like it would be like before closing prayer, he was out. And this guy would claim like, you know, they have the visitor parking up front. He would park in visitor every time. I'm like, dad, you can only really do it once or twice. He's like, well, we're not really members. We're always visiting. I'm like, okay. So he would like get out, move the cone, park. I'm like you're wrong but anyway so the, our church was hosting the christian power team and so i think my dad was intrigued by all these meatheads that were doing all these crazy feats for christ so ripping phone books you know or someone has a thing full of nails and they're walking across it and all this stuff so we went to that event and at the end there was the call to faith and i just i have always my mom says i've always been a kid since she can remember that would ask the big questions like what happens when we die what's the point of this you know like and so she goes i had to start at least give you a couple options so i gave you a bible i gave you you know like she goes i know how to explain it and so i've always kind of had that curiosity of what's next um and that night i just remember being so moved by the spirit that just had to grab my dad's hand it's like let's just go let's give our lives to jesus um and there's a lot, it's amazing when you look back, like I know people who have come to faith and it's like an instant 180, boom, like they know it's there and they are forever changed from that moment on. 
but for me, it's been a slow build, you know, like there's that decision moment to where you recognize, like, I need at that point, to be honest, it was probably just like, I don't want to go to hell. I want to be with the Lord forever. I want to go to heaven. So that's probably, you know, a lot of the motivation. But looking back, it's just baby steps through high school, you know, and it's like a graph where you're going up and then you dip, going up and then you dip. And then there were certain behaviors where you used to do that used to be consistent to where you're like, nope, those aren't even a thing anymore. You know, like the things you've prayed about, certain habits. And trust me, there's still things that I'm praying for <laughs> to change. And you're constantly trying to, to work your way to being like Christ. But I definitely remember that night. Um because it changed, it changed my life forever, you know? And I, I didn't know really anything at all. I just knew that Jesus sounded amazing. I wanted to live like him. I wanted to be saved by him and wanted him to be Lord over my life. I, you know, and I think really, probably, like I said, at that moment, it's probably just savior, right? Like save me to where ne- like, it's been a constant, like, no, I want you to be Lord over my life savior like not just get out of hell card i want i just want to be walking with you and that is been an awesome gosh it's been almost, it's been almost 20 years so <laughs> that's I, it's been a uh, you know a, a fun climb and it's been um i'll never I'll always forget i'm gonna always remember that moment because you know when you get when you get saved with your father that's a really cool experience my mother was there too as well my mother has um i think she struggles with her faith a lot more than my dad and i did um but i keep uh keep praying for her and working working on her how much um or how often i should say did you and your dad talk about faith was that something after that day that that allowed you to have some conversations with him that were deeper and, or, or is it still kind of, cause as some people, even though, you know, the other person's a, a believer, it's still hard to go deep with yeah. some people and with your dad, I don't, you know, the relationship with him that you had, how did that, you know, change, if anything, the conversations that you and him had going forward? Um, it changed, you know, it changed a lot of my perspective on success, like what success is in football. Um, my dad's a very proud dad, very proud father. And so, you know, I think sometimes he would get more fired up over um, what he seemed unjust if I got left off of some team or, you know, whatever. And it's like, I, I would just have, it changed my whole perspective on what success is. Like I, I was still competitive, you know, but it was just like the reason why I was competing was from a whole new place and a whole new motivation. And so we would talk about that and, and uh, he never wanted me to lose an edge. And even though he was a believer as well, that was something where I think I was just had a contentment about the way things would be going, knowing that I was giving it my all and that whatever it was, it was for God's glory. And so, um, but we, yeah, we definitely talked and we would develop, uh, we would talk, you know, certain times about what we had heard at church, different churches, you know, living in different States, um, and so, yeah, it's, you're right. It's what's been fun too, for me is that my wife uh, was raised Catholic. And so we met in college and then that was the first time she had kind of just started going to, to a non-denominational church. And um, what's been fun with her is to go back and forth about, um, she got baptized when I was in the NFL, which was an awesome thing to see, you know, and, and be a part of, but there's been, it's been awesome to talk about, like, what are what are some of the things that we, that she absolutely loved about the Catholic church, you know? And and so it's a whole level of theology that I think um, Francis Chan sums up pretty well in his book. um, His last book, I forget the title until unity maybe. And um, it's just the wide range of like Christians can fight so Mm -hmm. much over some of the smallest things. And some of them very important. I don't want to diminish some of the branches and theology, but at the end of the day, like, do we, do we sit and actually realize that God's prayer for us is that we would be united and be one and that people would recognize how we were different by the way we loved others and how united we were. And I think that's a challenge right now for, for the church as a whole is there's, there can be so much finger pointing um, and we're not immune to it. Right. I mean, as believers, we, we can say, Oh, culture, culture, 
we're part of that <laughs> the Christian Christianity, you know, and I think sometimes whether the yeah. church gets too much on the right or too much on the left, I start to cringe just like, Oh, we're just, we're just supposed to be different, you know? And, um, but we always got to look in the mirror in those moments too, and make sure that you're, that you're uh, repenting of your own, of your own crap. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it, James. Um, as we wind down, my last question for you, when you think back, you know, it's been about a year, it was September 22nd last year. When you think back to that moment to where God's brought you to today, and you mentioned your, your new baby that was born and now you're the dad of three girls. Um, go for four while you're at it. Cause my brother has four girls and, uh, oh, yeah. you know, he's walking around like a chicken with his head cut off. So, um, all the best to you with, the, with those <laughs> girls, but what, what is the Lord showing you and taught you, um, in the past year? You know, what's the great lesson that you could say, yeah, God, I got it now. Or, um, I'm getting this now when you think back to a year ago and, and where God's brought you to today. Well, I'm a, I'm, I'm an achiever. Um, I just like to strive. And I think what I've learned over the last year is that I'm trying to be better on just being with God and not trying to learn, 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 learn more about God. I want to be with God and not just learn more about him. And I think obviously like, there still are habits that I've done for years, whether it's going through the Bible in a year, whether it's um, podcasts and all this stuff, the, the funeral really put me in a place to where like I needed to re rely on that hope that we talked about. And so it was a lot of learning about God, but in that learning about him, it was just be present with me and quit striving, just sit and be with me. Um, and when you're a dad of three girls, it's scary, but what an awesome responsibility. I've always, you know, I, my wife and I were always like, boys, boys, boys. And then we had our first daughter and then we found our, our second daughter and then it was the third. And I'm like, honestly, like the amount of quite times you get asked, do you want a boy? And I'm like, to be honest, I don't care. I just want them healthy. That's it. I just want them healthy. And on some respect, I actually love the fact that I have girls because I don't get this, you know, I don't get any football questions. I just get to sit there. There's no pressure to do any sport or whatever. I just get to sit there. And they're so different. Our, my first two are so different. I can't wait to see what the third one's like because, I mean, Jason, they are polar opposites. Polar out in every way, shape, and it just – but uh, just the awesome responsibility that, you know what, these kids are not mine. I'm just stewarding them. I'm like I, – I have the awesome responsibility of raising them. They belong to God. I'm going to try to show them what that looks like to be a follower of Jesus and probably pray for a lot of grace along the way as I screw up as a dad and try to repent of it and, um, and just love them the best that I can unconditionally. And thank goodness that we have a good father who has shown us how to do that. The unconditional love. He loved us. You know, we he didn't wait for us to love him and then say, okay, you're good. You know, great. It was, uh, he relentlessly pursued us and um, trying to keep that that same mindset with my girls. And I tell them frequently, I, even after, um, if I have to, to yell to get their attention, if I have to discipline in, in any certain way or take something away and they're crying, I'll, you know, I'll always tell them that there's nothing you can do on this earth that'll ever make me not love you. Like, I want you to know, like you are so loved, but I still got to take away the TV, <laughs> you know, I still got, but it's just this idea of like, I never want them to, to ever feel that, that shame or in, you know what I mean? Just like you are so loved by your mom and dad. Um, and because of that, you know, maybe we should change this behavior next time. But, 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 uh, God it's does awesome. that to and us I, too, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I love being a dad. Oh, I love being a dad. It is, it is the most, um, it is stressful. It's exhausting. You know, this, it's ex exhausting at times. It. um, especially most of the time now I shouldn't even be complaining because my wife's the one breastfeeding and going through the grind, but, um, it's just, you know what? I look back on, I like, I look at my friends who don't have kids and aren't married and they have this whole like, Oh, I don't have time. And I'm just like, stop, stop. Like if you don't have children and you're not like, there's not a, like, once you have that first child, you wake up, like there's not another day in your life where you're gonna wake up and be like, what do I want to do today? Yeah. Like <laughs> it's all, yeah. it's all catered around, you know, your kids. And that's, 
that's a wonderful, awesome responsibility. And, um, I've just been, I'm thankful. I really am, man. I'm just thankful for, uh, the continued blessings. We've been very fortunate with our health during this, this really tough year for a lot of people. And, um, you know, just try to take it day by day, man, you know, day by day and realize that, Hey, I'm gonna screw up. Right. I'm not gonna be perfect with this. I'm gonna screw up a little bit. And, uh, you know, we'll have to try to keep, uh, keep repenting and hopefully they extend grace to dad as well. And we do have football back. So that's a good thing too, right? We're excited for football. We do, <laughs> we do man. Yes, so we do. And so I can't, I can't wait to see that. Hopefully, you know, we'll have the full stadiums like everybody intends. So. And how much different, I mean, if you ever needed to know how much fans matter, I mean, my goodness, you can just sense it in some of these things that we are seeing fans again through the summer, the beauty of sport and just coming together and all that. And, and I understand like that's, that's a big crave of a lot of people. Like let's come back together. And whether you're there or not yet, just try to love people anyway. Right. And be kind, be kind. Exactly. Uh, he is James Laurinaitis. Thanks buddy. Thanks for yeah, um, being, being here, coming back on the show um, and talking about some, some deep topics, but I appreciate you. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll do it a third time. Maybe we can do it in person at some That'd point. Be great, Who knows? Man. We'll see. That'd be awesome. That'd be, I'll come, I'll come to the barn and we'll yeah, set up shop in the barn. Go. How's that? There we go. There we go. <laughs> I got, we got battle these finches, these finches. I keep chirping because I think they have a nest in here. I got, I got to, I got to deal with that, but it's all right. It's good. Right. It's good background noise yeah. for our audience as they were listening to the pot. So it's all good. <laughs> awesome, man. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yep. Thank you. And many thanks to the three-time All-American at Ohio State, James Laurinaitis, for joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. You can listen to him on 97.1 FM in Columbus, Ohio, every day from 9 a.m. to noon Eastern, Monday through Friday. He'll also be doing Big Ten Network analysis on select college football games this season. And isn't it great to say that very soon we're going to be tuning our televisions and our phones and watching college and pro football. So really appreciate James, by the way, for sharing what he did, uh, particularly about his faith and about his dad losing his father on today's show. Uh, It's not easy. And I did ask him before we started recording if he was good with talking about that. But I just think sometimes when you are able to hear somebody else's perspective, when they lose someone, I think it can help us all as we process grief and helping us all as followers of Christ process grief as well. Um, So I appreciate James for for coming on the show. Do us a favor. Make sure you subscribe and like this podcast and then tell someone about Sports Spectrum's podcast. That way they never miss an episode. You never miss an episode as we bring Jesus back into the conversation. Again, my name is Jason Romano. You can reach me via email, jason at sportspectrum.com. And please do tune in next time for a brand new episode of our podcast. Have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time right here on Sports Spectrum.